Good morning. Thank you for choosing this section this morning. And my name is Kevin Corcoran. I'm from the Connecticut Business Planning Association. Um, I'm very pleased to be here to be able to talk about open educational resources. Normally, in a larger crowd, I would ask folks to raise their hand how many folks are familiar with the term OER or open educational resources. But I'm going to jump right in and just show you some national data. So the Babson Survey Research Group um, a couple years ago did a national survey around OER across higher ed. And what, one of the interesting findings they, they found a couple years ago was that about 66% of faculty across the country weren't really familiar with what open education resources meant, not only to the students, but to themselves, as, well, as far as what benefit it could be for their own teaching and learning style. So let's get to a baseline where we can at least explore what OER is. I'm not going to read this word for word, but the two elements I want you to remember about open education is, generally speaking, the open part is a licensing structure. The open license allows you to reuse somebody's work and most times actually revise it as you see fit. The other aspect of the open education resource case is that generally it's free of charge. There may be a charge if you choose to print something, there may be a low cost uh, denominator for something that is maybe interactive, but generally speaking, open education resources are openly licensed and freely available. So if you're familiar with the term in any form or fashion, it's generally been associated with open, uh, open textbooks, textbook replacements. And, and we're going to get to that piece in a little bit, but I, what I want you to understand is that OER, Open Education Resources, is a broad spectrum of items. So it can be full courses, full digital courses. It can be any element of a course material. It can be modules, it can be streaming videos, test banks, quizzes, software, lectures, what have you, and textbooks. So textbooks is a subset of the Open Education Resources. And to go broader, and this may be a presentation Claire does next year, but there, in the broad sense of open, there's open access, open journals, there's a whole library aspect to, to openness. So why does this matter? Well, I'm going to assume that at some point in time of your teaching career, you've had a student show up the first day of, of a class without their, their textbook, or their materials not prepared. Has it, has it been the first week, first month? the whole semester until the final is done, or maybe not even with the final. Have you ever had an opportunity where you've gotten a commercial textbook and you've found it deficient in some form or fashion, you've had to create supplemental instruction? Because you've had to create supplement because you couldn't change the text or the materials in and of itself because it's a, it's a closed license. Well, some of the benefits to you is that you have a little bit more freedom when you start using open material. So these are licensed, uh, licensed materials that have the ability to be reused, redistributed, and, and revised as you see fit. So some of the pieces that you can do with open is you can replace your existing textbook, but you don't have to. You can start with supplemental. You can say what's out there that, that, that corresponds or supplements my existing course materials that's free and open, so there's not an existing an additional cost to my, my students. So right then and there. So, and then also, if you have these resources at the zero cost, students don't have to worry about cost avoidance. There isn't a decision, am I going to buy this or not? It's a zero cost sum, especially in its digital format. Another piece is, and I'll show this uh, federal legislation, is that all courses are required to have all of their required materials listed in the course catalog prior to registration. So students have a full understanding of what the full cost is for a course. So if you're doing a current events course, and you're three weeks into the course and you want to go in terms of something that's a national event, well, by law, you really can't go assign another text or another piece of material for a cost to the student because it wasn't part of the original listing. Well, with open, especially in this digital format where it's freely, freely available and, allow, and free for you to revise, you can do just-in-time type of changes to your curriculum. So you can go out into the open community and say, I'm going to take this resource, zero cost to my student, I'm going to adapt it, I'm going to adopt it into my class right now because it's relevant to what's happening in the global setting. So there's the ability to be a little bit more dynamic, the ability to contextualize pieces, so the ability to customize your work. So you have the, the license structure, the permission, the copyright permission to go and say, you know what, I know by default that commercial textbooks are the two main audiences in the United States, Texas and California. 
because of their largest consumers, that's the target market. But let's say I'm teaching US history, and I want to do something that's focused on Connecticut history. Well, I want to insert a chapter specific about Connecticut and the role that Connecticut River or Quinnipiac River played in that. You can do that. You can take something that's an open license history book and insert a chapter into that. Or you can modify existing chapters that are in there. So you can make it relevant to your students or to what your topic is. And you have the ability to unbundle from the publisher. So you don't necessarily have to say, okay, well, here's who's kind enough to give me all of these materials. Well, I like two out of the three, but I don't like this this third one. Well, you can go freely and select something else that you feel is more relevant and then modify it as you see fit. So this is really all about academic freedom for you. You go and take something that somebody else has put the time and effort and quality assurance to modify it to your needs. And lastly, there's a number of efforts out there, and I'm going to touch on these in a couple of minutes, where there, these resources have gone through a, a vetting process. There's a quality assurance, there's a peer review, We'll talk about a project out of Cal State where there are a national audience that is basically going to peer review. So, before we go on, I just want to give you a snapshot. So, across the United States, this is what the faculty who are adopting open resources, this is the percentage they're doing. So, if you look at the top, most of it's been around images and videos as supplemental instruction to what they're already doing. It's not until you get to the mid-range where you start getting to e-books, open textbooks, or even whole courses where they're doing wholesale things. So even the majority of adoption that's happening across the country is supplementing and making sure you have appropriate copyright or licensing to do that. So I can't go too far without actually addressing the student dilemma aspect of this. So we've already talked about students coming to day one in class unprepared, maybe going an entire semester without a textbook. And I'm sure all of you have seen one of these excuses from your students. The textbook back ordered in the mail, out of stock, unnecessary until I decide I want this course, unnecessary until the final exam, unnecessary at all. You know, they may be borrowing old, old versions, they may be doing whatever they can, they may be referencing Chegg. There's a cost avoidance piece that students are really trying to struggle with. And the reason for that is the rise of college textbook pricing has tripled against the rate of inflation over the last four years. So again, the, the cost of textbooks has increased triple the rate of inflation over the last decade or so. So it's just not sustainable for students. Just focusing on kinetic. So this is for the 2014-2015 academic school year. Connecticut was projected our students spent $147 million just on textbooks. The public institutions represent $100 million of that. So that's UConn and Comsky, or CSE. I want to just drill down to the Community College story for a second. So this is data that the Board of Regents gave a couple years back for the 2011-2012 school year. Just general sites, so we're talking about um, Gen A level. 11,000 students across all 12 campuses, just taking general site. The average textbook cost at that point in time, now this is three, four years ago, was $175 for a new textbook for just general site. Those students, those 11,000 students spent nearly $2 million just on a single textbook. Now, if you're thinking about the student, the student audience for the community college, these folks are making decisions. Do I buy dinner? Do I buy textbook? Do I pay rent? Do I buy a textbook? So going back to the national data that Florida pulled together, at some point in time in a student's academic career, 60% of them will go without a textbook. So if you think about something that's a foundational course like math, and they don't have a textbook to anchor them, they're lost. And you can see it down for some data for administrators to see, is that there's a number of students who are doing course avoidance based on cost. So they're dropping the course or withdrawing from the course. So they're lost the tuition dollars because of cost of avoidance. The students are becoming more consumer-centric. Uh, they're looking at courses and they're looking at the total cost, not just with the tuition dollars, but with the textbook costs and making decisions. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to just go through a scenario. Since I, I presented the general psych book as sort of the theme here, you know, the, the current listing for a new intro to psych is about $200. So you think, okay, what are the what are the avenues that students may have? 
point that can go in that. We don't want that avenue. Okay, so one of the pieces that you might talk about is let's do a rental. So we rent the textbook for a semester and then we give it back. Well, the rental cost for this book is still $100. Now, if you think of it as a foundational piece, if they're going to be a science major, we'll sit, just say it's a math course, and they don't have that foundational math book after that first semester, how are they going to do? They don't have that reference point that they're always going to point back to. So one alternative is to go open. So Merlot is a repository that is um, funded and supported through Cal State. And the interesting thing about Merlot is not only does it give you some information around when the resource was first added to the repository, when it was last updated, what types of material um, is this HTML, can it be a PDF, an EPUB, is there a component for print? Not only does it give you some good information about the, the resource, and you can evaluate it right here online, but it also gives you some reviews here. So the editor review is that peer review piece. So Cal State pays faculty across the country to go against a rubric and evaluate every article that is submitted to this repository. And beyond that, there's potentially user ratings. So if you think about Amazon, those who've bought this or those who've adopted this have felt this. So not only is there a peer review, there's also a user adoption review. And then you can see how many times it's been added to different collections through its use. So you get a sense of how widely is this adopted, how well has it been reviewed. So you can do a little bit of filtering. If you're not seeing great stars or not great adoption, you can say, well, this isn't something that could be sustainable potentially. So this is one avenue. Yes. Uh, is, is it possible to see who's adopting it? Yes. Because that might be more important than how many are adopted. Yes. So you, when you when you log in, you will you'll have a free account to go into Merlo. Once you register, if you adopt this, it'll actually be able to see who's done that. So you'll have the ability to go and communicate with those folks and say, what's your experience been? How have you done this? What have you done as far as changes to the text? And depending on the license structure, which we'll get into in just a couple minutes, there's sometimes um, iterative uh, um, versioning of this that where enhancements are done, they're brought, brought back to the community. So I want to talk about uh, one other program in detail before I go into that one. There's a, an, uh, an initiative out of Rice University in Texas, OpenStax. And what OpenStax has is a, a, a ton of grant funds where they're doing sustainability um, development of physical textbooks. So they're focused solely on text where below is any type of open ed resource. OpenStax is specific to, to, to textbooks, open textbooks. The great piece about this, again, in a digital format, so PDF, EPUB, HTML, have you, this is a zero cost sum. Now one of the concerns folks have, well, I like something tactile, my students like something tactile, we like to highlight something, one page is the first one. So OpenStax has a fulfillment piece. So this Sociology book, bound, printed, color edition, like rivals any commercial textbook, $33 delivered. Now, if you look at the comparison, I know General Psych, I'm, I'm just going to make a leap of faith here. You know, we had a $193 General Psych book that was brand new. This is $33. This statistics book, because it's a little bit beefier, was $50 delivered. And I'm going to hand these out. Right. You can get a sense of the Thickness, the quality, the volume. And the great thing about OpenStax is, is it has a partnership arrangement with most bookstores. So what this means is that if you have Follett, you have MBS, you have Barnes & Nobles, OpenStax can work with your bookstore to do fulfillment so students can use their financial aid to buy these printed versions at that reduced cost. So your students can still get physical textbooks through the bookstore using their financial aid dollars as they would normally do any other commercial textbook with this program. So this is one of the, the resources that's highly adopted across the country. So one of the reasons why I've had the opportunity to go campus to campus and talking about OER is that there is this student conversation. So, and President Brody even mentioned it. You know, we're here today to talk about student success. And there are advocacy groups out there for students. 
So there is a organization called PERD, it's the Public Interest Research Group, and there are state chapters. And Connecticut has its own, and its headquarters on the University of Connecticut at Storrs campus. And one of their um, focus is on student affordability. And so uh, a couple years ago, they coordinated a message to legislators basically stating, we as the student population feel that we're spending too much on textbooks, that this is impacting our affordability, our success, what have you. And there was a, a, a social media campaign called Textbook Broke, where students were basically holding up pictures and signs and saying, I spent X number of dollars per semester on text. So these two four students at UConn spent $700 one semester just on textbooks. So, the short of this is that this momentum got legislative attention. So last February, there was a bill that was introduced into the state legislature around open education. And that bill is now a special act. So this was executed on July 2nd, this past summer. And it's done a couple things. But mainly what it has done is established an OER task force, and Claire is one of the members of that task force. There are representatives from the, from the University of Connecticut, from the community colleges, the state universities, the private institutions. There are representatives from administration, library, faculty, and students. So it's a good cross-population. And the role for this task force is to get an understanding of where institutions are in OER awareness, OER adoption, what obstacles they may face, and how can we address those, and where are the opportunities to actually have this conversation a little bit further? So one of the byproducts that we hope to have for early September, early fall, is a survey, uh, a statewide survey where we're going to basically uh, do a temperature check on how folks are feeling about what their awareness is, what they might see, perceive as potential barriers, and what type of support they may need on their local campus if, if they're interested in moving forward. So uh, the one point is this is not a mandate in any form or fashion. This is an exploration, this is a report for the legislature. Now I, I want to talk a little bit about the federal level. So there is a law in place that isn't necessarily OER centric, but it's more of a student advocacy piece. So there are a couple pieces in here that publishers must disclose the price to professors, to faculty. So you should be aware of what your textbooks, your current textbooks, cost your students. That's something by law that the publisher should be making aware to you. So if you are adopting a $250, $300 textbook, the publisher has to tell you that that's the cost that your students are going to realize if they buy a new version. Additionally, there's a number of publishers that do bundled packages. So I know that um, Pearson My Math Lab comes bundled with a textbook. Or there are other packages where things come together, like uh, access codes, what have you. As of 2010, publishers are not allowed to create that bundled piece. They have to be able to sell it as individual pieces. So if a student only wants to buy the access code, they should have the ability to do that. Lastly, specific to your text, your, your bookstore, the ISBN number has to be listed in your course catalog. So if a student wants to go to Amazon, and they are, they have the ISDN number to go find a cheaper price than what the bookstore offers. And the current data right now is that students about at a 60% rate are not going to your bookstore anyway. They're going to Amazon, other avenues. And then you tack on students that are doing cost avoidance and not purchasing a textbook at all, the bookstore revenues and on a sort of a natural evolution are declining year over year. I want to talk a little bit uh, at the federal level a little bit more. So at, in Congress, the Affordable College Textbook Act has been reintroduced into this session. So this is something that Dick Durbin and Al Franken introduced a, a year or two back. And what's interesting about this is they're proposing that there's going to be a competitive grant application process for faculty so that the federal government will actually give out awards, financial awards for folks to actually investigate, research, evaluate, and potentially implement OER in their existing courses for the end result to impact student affordability and student success. Beyond this proposed piece that may be tied to the Reauthorization Act for Higher Ed, the Department of Labor has already put in policies in supporting OER. So if your campus is participating in a tax grant, you have a requirement to reduce OER at the end of that TAC grant. 
the Federal Department of Ed also has policies in place that basically said if you're getting federal DOE money, you have to produce something that is OER. And the reason behind this is that if the taxpayers of America are funding a project, the taxpayers of America should have access to the, to the end result. It's, it's sort of the, the, the global thinking on this. So I want to talk briefly about this slide because this is a slide that usually has some challenging. What research has shown, and I'll do the, the one caveat, is that this program, the Kaleidoscope, was a Gates, um, the Gates Foundation funded piece. And this Kaleidoscope um, organization has turned into a national organization called Lumen Learning. What they were doing was they were doing comparison. They were having side by side where you had a faculty member who was teaching their traditional course with the traditional commercial textbook versus a course that was using OER materials that had been revised to meet better meet the student needs. And in this scenario where the open materials were revised to be more contextually relevant, students were performing better. So I, I understand all of the, the other pieces of, okay, well, it depends on the new day of the week, or students you know, having text, test anxiety, all the factors that go within maybe discrediting some research. But there is, um, and off screen right now, there is a website that's the Open, um, open Ed Group, and there's a whole collection of similar reports that have been done at campus levels where there's been a faculty member who's done side-by-side -side comparison. One section of the course using traditional, one section of the course using modified OER. And what they're seeing is the students are performing at the same level, if not better. And I'm hoping towards the end of this presentation, two faculty members from Housatonic who have adopted OER might be able to stop in and talk about their experience. And they've seen that they've adopted an OER platform for math and your students are performing at the same level. So from a business impact, I just want to touch on this ever so briefly, is that generally in this conversation there's concern about bookstore revenues. That the bookstore has some impact on the institution's revenues. That the percentage either going to student um, stipends or, or scholarships, or that there's revenue coming back. And if we go this route of this free or low cost piece, it's going to have a negative impact on the institution. If you think back to that slide from Florida where they were showing 14% of students were doing drops, 10% were doing the draws, there's a website that does a business impact on OER adoption. And it basically says the money that you would have lost in tuition is more than recovered and that you're getting greater gains by tuition recovery than you would by books for loss. Are not having to make a decision about avoiding a cost or a textbook because of, of, of the, the dollar signs, they're actually able to take that course and still have money to pay for to get to the course. So that's the argument, and there's, this website is fantastic. There's a bunch of sliders, so you can actually change the parameters and really see if you do a small scale versus a large scale um, deployment, how does it really impact the institution's financial health? So let's talk about a little bit of the nuts and bolts. Now, this is a great quote that talks about how the internet really enables folks to share information. I want to flip this quote a little bit backwards. So one of the great things about it is that, you know, as an author, as a publisher, yes, the internet is a great way for me to do worldwide distribution and gather feedback. At the same time, it's a great way for me to just do a quick Google search and grab what I seem as free, uh, free quick and easy, and take that without necessarily thinking about the copyright impact. So, quick question. Which one of these images is, is copyright protected? On the camera, do not, so, or you can... Well, so, uh, they're both. They're both. So, you know, this one, obviously, drawn by a, a child, and, you know, you may assume, well, that's not copyright because it's a professional, and obviously this one's done by a professional photographer. But they're both copyrighted. By default, they have all rights reserved. By default, any digital work is all rights reserved. In this particular case, both of these have a license structure that allows them to be freely used. So right here, this citation basically says that this is using a Creative Commons licensing that basically says, if you give me attribution, and as long as you don't charge for the use of this, 
you can use this as you see fit. Okay? So don't only integrate, but then openly license. So let me go into a little bit more about Creative Commons, because that's really the engine that really powers OER. So this is a nonprofit organization that basically created a legal structure. And there are four main components of the licensing law. So there is share alike, attribution, non-commercial, and no derivative. So I'm going to start here. Attribution. You can use my work as you see fit. You can modify it. You can redistribute it. You can share it. You can combine it with other works. The only thing I ask you to do is give me credit that the original author was this work. So it's the most open of all. Share alike. Again, you can use my work as you see fit, modify it, whatever. However, if you make improvements on it, I want you to pay it forward. I want you to share it back to the community. I just don't want you to hold on to it if you've made improvements. So again, these two are very open, very community focused. These two still allow you to use the resource. So again, you can use this as you see fit. You can even modify it, but what you can't do is you can't sell it, and it can't be involved in a, in a commercial game. Now, I want to make one distinction on that. That does not mean you can't do it in an academic setting where tuition is being charged. That's not the case. It's saying you can't take that resource and resell it for a personal gain. And then lastly, this no derivative. If you feel that you've made a simple work that never needs to be edited or improved on, and that no other opinion can ever basically enhance that work, you slap that out and says, you can use my work as is. You can distribute it as you see fit, but you cannot alter it in any way. So these are the main components or attributes of Creative Commons license. And you can mix and match in any way. So again, from the most free, you know, outside of public domain, but CC BY, basically, just give me attribution, just give me credit, down to attribution and share, share alike, so pay it forward. Attribution, no commercial, no derivatives. And so you can mix and match these pieces to basically protect or share your work as you see fit. And as a consumer, as fact you may want to consume, this is your roadmap. So if I want to take something and I want to modify it as I see fit, these icons, these symbols, basically tell me what I can and can't do. So there are the common pieces, but there are five R's around OER, open education. So the ability to retain your intellectual property. So again, if you're in publishing and you've created a work and you've then sold it to a publisher, you're releasing your IP. You no longer have the right to reuse that work. You may be getting royalties for that work, but you've lost your intellectual property rights to that material. So with this license structure, which is some rights which reserved, I still get to retain my intellectual property. I get to share it as I see fit, but I still own the, the original content and the license or the, or the IP to that. Beyond that, this is giving permission to reuse the work. So your colleague, either in the next department, in the next state, in the next country, can reuse this work in a, in a legal manner. Revise. So again, making things textually relevant to the students. I like 90% of this work, but I want to change the last 10%. That allows you to do this. And then Remix, which is really cool. Okay, I have 90% of this resource I really like. There's 10% of this resource I really like. I want to combine the two into a brand new resource. This licensing structure allows you to take those different pieces and meld them into a new resource. And lastly, again, the redistribution. So I want to share it across the department, I want to across the institution, across system, across the country, across the, you know, what have you. The license structure allows you to do that. So just to talk briefly about sort of this movement. In the Northeast, we're a little bit behind the times to a certain extent. This movement really started in the United States on the left coast. So Washington, Oregon, California, they've been doing this 15 plus years. Which is great because they've been pioneers, they've been um, innovative. They've also fought whatever legal issues that the publishers may see. So you can imagine that this has an impact on the publisher's bottom line. And when this first started happening, most publishers fought hard. Maybe fought early, depending on your your viewpoint. But those states fought back on student rights, faculty rights, academic freedom, and they won. So we don't have to do that. We don't have to worry about sort of the legal overhead of this. That fight has already been fought. But you can see just across the United States and, and actually North America, you can see that there's many 
broad initiatives being done across the states. I want to talk in some specifics to a handful of ones. I'm just checking the time here. So the state of Washington, about 15 years ago, decided it was going to take the top 100 enrolled courses in Gen Ed and see which ones had the highest impact on students, the highest cost hit. And what they decided to do is, instead of just adopting textbooks that would reduce some cost, they actually did full-blown online courses. So there are 81 courses in this open course library project that are fully vetted, full assessment banks, full textbooks, videos, all the supplemental material that you would need to run this course. And they've been made available free of charge to anyone. So if you're looking to maybe explore online or hybrid or, or sort of blended or flipped, you could actually take this free of charge, modify it inside Blackboard, take elements that you want. If you want to use some of the lesson plans for your face-to-face -face class, you can go in there and mine the resources and use it as you see fit. They've already put the investment into creating these courses, so they're free, freely available for anybody who wants those. In any form or fashion, you don't have to take the whole sum. You can take the individual parts. I've mentioned Cal State a little bit today. So there's one project that I, I, I highlighted in my law, which is a nice repository that has that peer review element to it. But there's another one that's called Affordable Learning Solutions. And I'm actually going to start to show a screenshot in a little bit. What's interesting about Affordable Learning Solutions is they have an ISBN search. So if you take your existing materials and you put the ISBN number in there, not only will it give you what are comparable replacement textbooks, It'll also give you supplemental instruction or the supplemental materials that match your commercial textbook. So again, it's not an all or none. It's not, it, OER isn't about only replacement. Most folks start with supplementing. Now, there are more aggressive ones. So University of Minnesota has a multi-state collaboration around textbooks. Tidewater Community College in Virginia is an interesting one. What they decided to do is they had a business degree and they decided that every course in that business degree would have a zero sum for textbooks. So that entire program was nicknamed the Z degree by the student body because there were zero costs associated with text and course materials. And lastly, probably the most aggressive one is the University of Maryland University College is doing this initial event now to eliminate all textbooks and all undergrad courses. So there's a zero cost sum for students to run course materials for their entire undergrad catalog. And they are going to be done at the end of this summer for undergrad. And how they award themselves, they basically said, come fall, we're going to start working on our grad programs. So this means that if, if they can't find a resource that's already out in the community to do a supplement or replacement, they're going to make the investment to build ones and then share them out to the community for their use. So this is pretty, um, pretty courageous, but that's not where we are in Connecticut, and that's not where we have to be either. There's a half a billion global assets in all of the OER repositories worldwide. There is so much out there right now, we don't really need to focus on building. We really need to focus on finding and adopting where it makes sense. So I do want to uh, circle back to the one comment I made about students sort of becoming consumer centric. So this is just a, a quick story out of Maricopa Public Community College in Arizona. They started listing which courses were low cost, no cost, material cost in, in their um, course catalog. And so you can see right here that um, OER will be low cost, no cost, no greater than $40 for course materials. So what students were doing is you see this um, accounting course listed against another accounting course section. So the same course, different section. One that had textbooks ranging over $200, one that was guaranteeing $40 or less. What do you think was happening for a moment? Right. So what was happening was, it was somewhat of a peer review forced by students from a consumer standpoint, is that other department, uh, other faculty in the department were sort of following me saying, if I want my course section to run, I need to make it more for the students. So this is just an interesting story where students were basically forcing the other department members to basically adopt just to stay relevant or to have their course sections run. Now, I don't know if Marina and Michael will have a chance to come in, but I want to share this story. And if they do come in, they can talk a little bit more. So since Brent who's the topic, I have to do a showcase on them. They decided a couple of years ago, they were using um, 
Pearson's My Math Lab in the bundled textbook for the students. And they weren't really seeing the results that they wanted, especially because it was a, a, a high burden on the cost. So the bundle was about $250 for that per, per student. What they did is they explored an open homework platform called My Open Math. So it's an equivalent to Pearson's My Math Lab, except it's a zero sum, it's free of charge, it's digital homework, perfect timing. Wow, <laughs> yes, So what I'm the slide that I have right here, don't sit down. <laughs> is that these wonderful folks decided, you know what, we're going to adopt my open math. We're going to look for a textbook out of Scottsdale, Arizona, community college. We're going to adapt it and make it more, meet Connecticut um, standards. And we're going to jump from a $260 cost per student down to 30 And the reason it's 30 is because they're getting a printed version of the textbook. Now, this is an in-person class that has lab time. So why don't you tell a little bit about your story and your decision to go this route? Any of you, please. Can you wear this one? Oh. As a microphone? Okay. This is fancy. <laughs> oh, and the camera. Hi. <laughs> Um, so I'm a math faculty from Hispanic started uh, here in January of 14 and uh, we were Marina and I were, were looking for resources for the intermediate algebra course and uh, I happened to stumble upon uh, Scottsdale Community College's math blog uh, so a WordPress blog and on that blog was basically uh, their uh, OER open educational resources uh, which included intermediate elementary algebra uh, also they had uh, college algebra as well uh, so we took that and we kind of ran with it uh, we took the book and I'm not going to go into two I'm going to just give you a fast forward approach okay <laughs> that fast forward approach we took it um, we edited it and uh, right now we're working on version 1.2. So we went through uh, their version and then uh, we created 1.0 for, for Housatonic. And then now we're working uh, with Middlesex Community College on making a <coughs> Connecticut wide version 1.2 of that OER book. And what really OER is really all about is this open licensing. Okay, and which allows basically for us to do that. So the Scottsdale, they were really awesome about letting us collaborate with them and use their materials, take their materials, giving them the credit for it, the work, crediting them. Under this open license, we were allowed to do all of this. So uh, this is really different than having a copyright, because if something's copyrighted, you can't use it, right? Um, and there's some very, very strict regulations about using copyrighted materials. Uh, so uh, right now, we're, how many sections are we doing? Jen and? Jen, we have 10. We have like 22. So it's 1095i. And and the, yeah, the, another key thing to this is the my uh, the myopenmath.com, uh, which was along with accompanies the book. So there's this workbook, which is a physical text which students buy in the campus bookstore. Um, and then there's this online piece, which is myopenmath.com. And that's great because uh, it's very easy for a student to get going on it. It's a free website. It's like my math lab-ish kind of, kind of thing. Um, so if you're familiar with my math lab, it's like that, uh, but free. So, because it's grant funded. Uh, it's a grant fun funded organization. So 
it's very it's it's really for our students for community college students saving money saving their money and time it saves a lot of time in class because a lot of times you have access codes and students fumble with the access codes where it's very uh, cumbersome for a new student to learn about different access different types of access codes that are require for different classes and it's a very confusing process but my open math makes it a little bit simpler because you get give them the access code and uh, they're able to get in right on their smartphone so first day of class you say take out your smartphones <laughs> they're not used to hearing professors say that take out your smartphones go to myopenmath.com and they're able to log in on their cell phone the first day. In fact, I rarely, in a regular traditional classroom, I, regular, I rarely ever have anyone that's unable to log in the first day. Everyone logs in the first day. So, whereas my, uh, my math lab, it, it was a chore, really a chore to get students to, to log in. Um, not all of them had the financial aid monies right away. It's another problem. Uh, so it, it, they're really, it's a really great, great thing. Um, so that's, that's where I'll leave off. And it's now, right now, we're having other people work on it in d different areas. Uh, we're having, um, uh, let's see, micro, bio, um, or gen chem, and uh, physics. Uh, and we're going to look into college algebra, making college algebra course uh, OER as well for the fall. Um, so we hope to, in the future, have our whole STEM and maybe <laughs> ideally whole college be going OER. Um, so we'll see. We'll see what happens. Do uh, you guys want to add anything? Take the mic from me. <laughs> Yeah. Have, have you gotten any resistance from colleges to which our students transfer, saying, I don't know that textbook, I don't know? For math, it's not meaningful because it's all computer based. So if you go to the syllabus and you see what they're covering, it's not the main days of teaching our factor and research that you're doing. They're not options of your life. You know what? This is the way you do it. So from from that we have to go and 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 and they get people to read it and evaluate them. They send it out to people to evaluate them. So the same thing happens here. In a way, that's a little bit better because it's almost like crowdsourcing. So you can see the books that are adopted the most. Mm -hmm. And you kind of go with those first because you see more people have adopted a particular book. So you say, okay, well, if so many people have used it, maybe that's a pretty good book to start off with. And you start off with something that more people have used and aligns to your and then if you don't like it, the ideal part about it is the best thing, but you can edit it to make it the way you want to edit it. And help us to do it. Because every college has a different view of experience. So you can maybe change the way you say something to help address the needs of your own students. That's the advantage. So you don't have to, you know, wait for someone else to do it. Yeah, two it's things. Yeah, yeah, it gives the faculty much more control, but uh, at the same time, it's it's the freedom, right? You have much more control, but you don't have to, right? Uh, there are pre-designed courses that exist out there that are OER that you could just take and just use. You don't have to think about redesigning the entire course necessarily if you don't want to, right? So there are there's that flexibility, that that freedom, I think. Have you seen any? I, I think Sandra Bond had that concern when she first started with OER because of the science. We were worried about it being, you know, something that the, the, the students could transfer with, you know, an, an unknown source. I, I, had, I had looked at this a couple, three years ago uh, for economics, and I used Greg Mankey's book, and I forget which website I went to, which OER place, but, but it actually said, 
do you want a textbook that looks like Greg Mangy? <laughs> okay. And it came back and it was really good, but I was just, I was scared to go any further because I thought, who's, who's going to recognize the quality of this open education resource, sort of like Greg Mangy, but not Greg Mangy's book? I, you know, I was worried about the transferability of the credit. Right now, everyone is now aware of it, so all community colleges are actually also on board. In fact, UConn is actually one of the big factors for open source now. And they are really promoting it, so if you tell them that you do it, they will put them and say, okay. I mean, it's not going to, it's not like it used to be 10 years ago. Right. I think things have to come along, yeah, things have come a long way in the past. It's, it's growing very fast, it's just in that exponential growth period right now. And people are all getting on board and understanding. Because the cost of textbooks are, oh, oh, language are not yeah. there. And they're almost, you know, half the cost of a college education is in your textbook. I think. In some ways, right, uh, th what's allowed for that to happen is uh, social media has put the power back into the, the, the youth and the, the students' social media. And through social media, they can say outrageous things like on Facebook, like, my book costs $400 a semester. Uh, and they'll get comments and responses on Facebook and social media. Oh, that's outrageous. Like, that's crazy. Mine was whatever, you know? Uh, so I think that it's a response, especially these student peer interest groups are a response to 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 this, and you know. It's all about your uh, your uh, your money. Yeah. 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 I'm not thinking about cost and not taking that into consideration. Your college is not going to be well. People are going to have bad reviews about the other college. So yeah, you have to be concerned about how you appear in society. Also, so that sort of it's not the best way to do things, but it does help push uh, away. And I assume that you haven't seen any difference in outcomes. Yeah, and that's another thing I was going to say is that we did a study with the I. across 30 sections at a $230 savings. Right. I mean, that, that one, I don't say one small, but that one change can have a mushroom effect. And, and to take Marina's point, maybe flip it around, this, instead of necessarily shaming, because that's not necessarily what, what I'm trying to promote here. Right. <laughs> <laughs> institutions have gotten a boost off this. So Tidewater Community College, this small, well, relatively small community college in Virginia, no one heard about them until two years ago when they're all of a sudden on the map as the default standard of having a zero-sum program. And to one-up that, now everybody's talking about University of Maryland, University of College, because they're doing zero across the board. So it actually does have this attraction factor for students. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm no problem. I'm giving the sign, I've got a couple minutes. I want to just get a couple of slides. Do you need a mic? Okay. Unless you want the camera to follow Oh, no. <laughs> That's good. I'll just little oh, right here. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I do want to highlight a couple other initiatives that are in the system. So one is from Eastern, um, and what I want to focus on is that these are new. Both these courses are relatively new within the last couple of years, and what these two faculty members did is they started from a, an, an approach of affordability from the design factor. So what Allison did for her 19th century one is she tried to focus on books that were in the public domain that had a zero cost sum. She w was working with different libraries that had free access for the students to go and look at reviews of the time. Her net cost for the students is $4 per student for that course. And then at Western, 
Chris's politi uh, politics and film, he went from what do we have in the, in the library? What, what resources can I use that are basically a zero sum piece because the library's already made an investment and that these are available to the students and faculty for free? So he's embedded all these resources versus using what he felt was a costly textbook that I believe he said exceeded $175. So this isn't necessarily OER savings, it's not cost avoidance, it's affordable by design out of the box for these two faculty members. So I, I just want to quickly wrap up here. So if you're interested, where do you, where do you begin? And it sounds like you've already done some exploration around, um, was it physics or chemistry? Yeah. Economics, I'm sorry. Uh, Lumen Learning has a whole uh, business uh, suite of products that they're putting out. So that might be some work. But start small. Maybe explore the existing OER in a supplemental piece. You don't necessarily have to focus on replacing, but that could be a good goal. I'm going to say it because Claire is in the room, but even if she wasn't, the library. The library is key. Most successful initiatives across the country have been successful because the library's provided support for faculty, especially when you're looking at a half a billion global assets in all the repositories worldwide. Your library is going to be key to help filter that search to specific pieces. If you have instructional design teams, they're going to help too, especially if you're adopting something. You want to make sure it's, it's standards-based, it's outcomes-based, and that there's accessibility in mind as well. Working with teams, either in your department, like who's the is doing, or cross-department, cross-institution, cross-state collaboration. And at the end game, if you get to a point where there's a resource that really doesn't meet your needs, or that you have a niche need that hasn't really de been developed by the community, then consider publishing and, and releasing it to the general public so that there's sustainability in that and that other folks can adopt that and then look at it and see if there's ways that they can enhance it for you. There are a number of resources out there, maybe too many, but this is just a, you know logo soup up here. But I do want to go quickly through some of these and I've got about a minute. So we talked a little bit about OpenStax, the hardcover books that went around. OER Commons is a great place because not only does it allow you to, to do it by discipline, by grade level, but it also allows you to do it by material type. So if you're looking for assessment banks, if you're looking for lectures, you can do that filtered search. I mentioned the ISBN search for Cal State. So this will give you related materials based on your ISBN. My Open Math, we've talked at length. The Open Text Library um, out of University of Minnesota is a nice collection of textbooks that have been vetted and peer reviewed. But in your everyday walk, there are places where you can do Creative Commons filtered searches. So Flickr has a Creative Commons filter, and it, you can actually see which ones have our attribution only, which ones are non-commercial, which ones can't you alter. In YouTube, there are Creative Commons licensed videos that you can use in any way you, you, you want to, even um, editing those and cutting out certain scenes. Creative Commons, the, the licensing structure that enables all this, has a meta search. You can actually do search across multiple areas for media, uh, uh, any type of element in here. <clears throat> and then Google. If you've ever seen the little gear in the upper right hand corner of Google and you wondered what it was, if you click on it, it brings you to advanced features. And then if you go down, there's a usage rights piece and that these options correspond with those license levels inside Creative Commons. So if you wanted to do a global search across every resource that Google has indexed, and you want to do it basically free to use, share, modify, even commercially, that's your CC BY, your, just your attribution, it's going to go find any resource that has that Creative Commons license structure for you. So Google is now your open friend. So I think I've finished on time, or pretty close to it. I really appreciate it. I, I know we've run short, but I'm more than happy to answer questions now or any time throughout the day, but thank you. Right. Is there questions before you run off to the next session? And I would encourage uh, folks that have free time to follow Marina and Jennifer and Michael to their presentation on OER. How do we make more faculty aware of this? Well, I was partly hoping this event would do that, and I hope it, it did. Yeah. Um, there is conversations at the system office level about finding ways to support all the campuses. I don't have a concrete deliverable to say that this is going to happen in this time frame, 
but there's been a supportive conversation at the system office on how they can support the campus and so that's coming um, the Connecticut Distance Learning Consortium is a, uh, a consortial entity within the state and we've been exploring grant opportunities for all of the, the institutions in the state so we're hoping that we may find one or more vehicles to basically pr promote and, and educate. See you in a couple. Anything else I can answer? I just had one. You kept talking about online, but it seems to me that no, no matter the construction of the course, as long as you're using Blackboard or some kind of platform, these are all available anyway. Most of these are available in printed form. So where OpenStax has a formal uh, agreement with most libraries, or excuse me, with most bookstore providers, many of these have a print-on-demand uh, service. So Amazon has a, a non-demand print feature that does fulfillment for these. So instead of actually walking into the bookstore and per, you know getting it off the shelf, it would come mailed through Amazon, and, and at a fraction of the cost of for printing and shipping than what it would be for if it had gone to the bookstore for a commercial version. So it, it's you know by by default it's a zero cost sum if the students can consume this in a digital format because there's no printing involved. It, even if they do print it. It, it's in a thirty to fifty dollar range, depending on the volume of the of the, the print and the back, the binding for it. Mm -hmm. Anything else that I can help with? If you have any questions after the fact, if you want, uh, you know, to have a conversation, how I might be able to help you, your campus, feel free to take down my email. Uh, this presentation will be redistributed throughout. I'm more than happy to help in any way I can. Has anyone ever tried? Taking the, o the OER textbook down to like Kinko's and say Curtis up and see what that was. Yeah, it, it's not as ad advantageous, um, you know, because you're you're basically going at what a, a twenty five cents a page, if not more, if you want to color, and then at the end of the day, you don't basically have something that has a a, a, a binder. Um, so you're basically working with a stack of papers that you've clipped together and a good gust of wind basically mm -hmm. just lost your resource. But th there, there is an on-demand print service through Amazon that is incredibly um, reasonably priced. So even if a student wanted to go and take a, a digital resource and print it for their own needs, they could, use, they could take the resource freely to bring it to the Amazon Web Service online and have them fulfilled themselves. So they don't have to go through the bookstore or through the faculty. Right. Do they print any textbook? Do students? Uh, yeah, for students. Well, anything, that is ba anything that's been licensed, yes, this service. Oh, yeah, so yeah, Amazon will, will look for the Creative Commons license. They're not going to take something that's okay. um, commercially protected. Wow. All right, well, thank you very much. Thank you.